and welcome once again to EWTN's Bookmark. I'm Doug Keck, your host. Our guests are Tom Peterson and Ryan Hanning, authors of The Willpower Advantage, Building Habits for Lasting Happiness, published by Ignatius Press, available through the EWTN Religious Catalog, EWTNRC.com, for all things Catholic. It's great to see you again, Tom. Welcome it's good to, to see EWTN. You. Good to be back. And it's great to meet you, Ryan. Uh, welcome to EWTN's Bookmark. Yeah, thank you. Likewise. So, Tom, tell us, you know, Catholics coming home keeps you busy, but in between you're writing books, and how did the two of you get together, and what's this book about? So, Catholics Come Home is still my day job, and uh, praise God it's going well in its 23rd year. Uh, we've invited uh, over a million people back to church, thanks to God's grace, and more evangelicals and airing them. But Dr. Ryan Hanning was my buddy in Phoenix when we both lived there, and he was our quarterback for Catholics Come Home uh, when 92,000 people. Uh, came back to the Catholic faith in the Diocese of Phoenix. And so we were friends ever since then for a long time, back in the 90s or early 2000s, and we've kept in touch and uh, decided to work together on this book. And it was actually done, okay, I think we had the idea like a year and a half, two years, maybe before COVID mm -hmm. uh, hit, but it seems so timely now because people are looking for happiness and they're not sure how to get there. Right, now you obviously are involved heavily in the home human potential movement and you spend all your time writing these books helping corporate executives to do better, right? Uh, no, that, was, <laughs> yeah, that, that might be more lucrative, but you know, I am in the business of raising humans. I have 10 little children oh, and yeah. you know, in truth, we wrote the book for ourselves. Yeah. You know, you know, really to, to respond to the question, the deepest question of our heart is, how do we become the men God has asked us to be? How do we become the fathers, you know, the husbands, the, the, the partners in crime, so to speak, in serving God's people? And it really came out of that. He, he wrote it for that reason. I wrote it because I came out of confessional, and in absolution, the priest says, go and sin no more. And in my head, as I'm kneeling down, I said, how am I supposed to do that? Right. So he may have had a purer motive than me, but I was trying to figure it out. Now, the beginning of the book here, Why Me, Why Now, uh, you guys write, we all want more peace and joy in life, but the chaos of our busy world seems to impede our progress. All around us, self-discipline and daily work ethic have been replaced by self-centeredness and around-the-clock personal entertainment. So, Tom, why has that occurred, and how do we combat that? Well, as a former advertising executive, I know that well. Uh, everything uh, out there is vying for our time and attention, and the evil one is vying for our time and attention. But Aristotle uh, so aptly says we, uh, you know, we become what we do. Mm -hmm. And so by repeating good habits and staying focused on Christ helps us to grow more Christ-like. But if we're lured by the world and all the little fishing hooks that are custom made for us, uh, each one of us, and we bite off on one of those hooks, we get lured in the other direction. So we said, let's go on a journey to explore a tool, a survey tool, which we'll talk about later called the spiritual audit, and a methodology where people, all different habits, all different temperaments, all different wirings, each one can find a path where they can find more happiness, and not only happiness, but really truly holiness, which is really the goal to, to unite with, with Christ. Now, Ryan, when you came together to write the book, did you guys say, I'm an expert in this area, Tom, you're an expert in that area, I'll take these chapters, you take those chapters. How did you work it out? Who wrote what? Yeah. Did you share back and forth? Who edited who? It ends up where we're both experts in sin. We're, we're both <laughs> fallen. We're, you know, we, he lives in Atlanta. I live in Nashville. We, we, we cuss in traffic. And we're, we're trying to do better. And so as we approached the book, it really was a journey in some ways of, yeah. of you know, brothers in, in faith trying to discover what's the wisdom and richness of the church to really answer that practical question. Mm -hmm. How do I go and sin no more? How do I how do I choose the good and reject the bad? How do I look at all those things vying for my attention and actually find joy in discovering the mission God has called me to? Yeah. So we really wrote it back and forth, and we joke that very often I brought the philosophy and theology. I'm a professor. Mm -hmm. you know, I've taught graduate and undergraduate students for the last, you know, almost 20 years, and, and you know, Tom sort of blue collarizes it. You know, I made it practical. I helped to make it practical. I'm my advertising guy who speaks right. to people, so it was really a great combination of talents mm -hmm. because I. You know, I may have said, I have this thought or this scripture in mind, how do we teach it? Ryan, with his theological background, was able to do it. I, with my advertising background, said, I think it's a little too deep. Let's make it so that everybody can understand. And it was a good combination, yeah, praise absolutely. God. Wow, well, you take the question on Tom in the beginning. The willpower and is neither pop psychology nor watered down Christianity. Obviously, as an advertising guy, people would think, mm -hmm. you, you kind of get these books, like you said, yeah. that are either straight human potential kind of thing, or they're, they're watered down 
Catholicism or Christianity. Right. So it's basically the standard stuff you'd get from Tony Robbins, nope. but you throw a couple of Catholic words on top of it. Not at all. In fact, it's completely opposite of that. Uh, the bottom line is, uh, when we unite our will with God's will, we truly find happiness and holiness. And so the willpower advantage is saying, when we unite our will with God, we gain His power and have an advantage. Now, we used an interesting secular title like that to obviously throw a bigger net out to the world so that people who are in various places on their journey would say, oh, that looks like an interesting book. I think I'll pick it up. They turn it over and read some of the references, Coach Lou Holtz, uh, Roma Downey, other people maybe in the secular world they're familiar with, maybe some of the Catholic names they may or may not know, and they say, oh, I, I'll give it a shot. And what's nice, though, is people who are deep into theology will find it rich and full of meat. People who are new on the journey will say, I can understand this. Right. It's interesting, too, because it, it, it doesn't scare people who, because of those names on there as well. Right. And in the packaging, which looks a little more generic, right. a little more secular. Now, also, three important questions. But the first one, imagine for a moment what life would be like if most Christians lived more authentically, just a small portion of Jesus' teaching. Isn't part of the problem we're, we're living with today, what is Jesus actually teaching? There seems to be a lot of people of different opinions, at least, over what he really cared the most about. Yeah, you know, the, 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 the mission of Christ is sort of in debate today, which is really sad because it wasn't in debate 50 years ago. People understood what Christ stood for. So much of the first part of the book is reintroducing the basic kerygma of what Christ stood for, what it means to turn the other cheek, what it means to stand up against injustice, mm -hmm. what it means to be a person of virtue. And, and so in many ways, you know, that first question of what would the world be, you know, be like if we followed the teaching of, of serving others you know, rather than serving ourselves, of, of, of forgiving others quickly and judging others slowly. And, and we all can agree the world would be a better place, but that, that takes work. And, and the, the truth is, is that work is, is not meant to be a burden. It's actually meant to be liberating. It's yeah. meant to be a joy. It's meant to be about discovering who you are and the gifts you've been given. Well, it says you've got some reflective questions in here. And a couple of, what would change in my life if I followed Christ's words more faithfully, which is something good for us all. But two at the end, I think it really hits the culture today. Would I be more or less free? That's the fear, mm -hmm. right? Would I be more or less happy? Yeah. Which is one of the reasons you wrote this book. Oh, yeah. Because what happens when you sin? You feel terrible. It may take you a few minutes or a little while to feel terrible, but you suddenly realize, I've separated myself from God. I don't feel good. What I thought was going to be medication or make me feel happy may have for a split second. Now I feel horrible. And uh, for example, when we give license to ourselves and we don't use self-control over our tongue in traffic, in busy traffic in Atlanta in my case, when I explode like that, you know, for a split second. So that's you who's in this book? Yeah, here? yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. That's your, that's <laughs> All your, your viewers know okay. it. I'm a choleric <laughs> melancholic. They know, they know Tom Peterson. He's the nice, calm guy. I'm the wired guy. But, uh, you know, you, and, and it releases, and then you say, ah, oh, I can't believe I did that. I just came out of confession three days ago, and now i got to go back. So what happens? You get less free. The devil binds you. You feel horrible. And he keeps riding that horse, replaying that scene in your head, yeah. saying, you're not, oh, look at you, Catholics come home guy, and all this, and preaching this, and look what you did in traffic. And that's exactly what he does to all of us uh, where our, wherever we are. So we lose the freedom. We lose the happiness. But... Through this book and through the methodology, I said, okay, there's a way I can keep my mouth closed. I can pray for those people who cut me off in traffic. Lord, keep them safe. Keep me safe. And then I have a peace about me. Sometimes I laugh when there's a traffic jam now. That is supernatural grace. That's not Tom Peterson. The one thing I wanted to mention, I appreciate you said the, uh, the, that the traffic is not the problem. It's our response to it. But yep. as president of EW Tim Religious Catalog, the idea that purchasing more rel religious medals for your visor is not a good idea. I want to counteract that and say both of these options are important. Uh, so uh, EWTNRC.com is the place for all things Catholic. Now, you also talk about the idea that this book is not a, diff a quick spiritual fix. Mm -hmm. And isn't that part of the problem? We're all looking for that 10 things to do to change my life in 10 minutes. Yeah, you know, the, the entire message that, that Christ came to claim is that I've, I've come that you might have life to the fullest, right? John 10, 10. And our entire life is about really discovering, you know, what God is calling us to and, and how we can participate with his grace. And so it's not a quick fix. It's really a lifelong journey. This is why, you know, the, the typical Catholic response when one of our Protestant brothers says, you know, are you saved is, 
I'm saved, I'm being saved, I will be saved. It's, right. it's an ongoing process. And the truth is, is that's a process that's actually fun and liberating and actually helps you really understand your gifts and your talents and how you're called to be a gift to others and truly become happier the more you dive in to growing in virtue. If what he's saying is so true, why does it take books like these to convince people to do it? Well, it, it, it technically doesn't. You know, people could read scripture, they could partake in the sacraments regularly and follow Christ and it would work. Mm -hmm. Sadly though, people oftentimes want to hear it through a different voice or a different lens. So we're trying to make it easy for people in this generation to understand, take the scriptural truths that Jesus taught and maybe put them in practical application uh, examples so people go, oh, I get it. Kind of like Jesus taught with parables, we're trying to do the, a similar thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so that people say, oh, that makes sense to me. Uh, it, you know, it now rings true. You know, our world is short of spiritual directors. They're busy, they're not available, you know, whatever. We're hoping this will hold people right. by the hand and say, okay, we understand that you've got a unique temperament. You're wired differently than I am and everyone else. However, based on your temperament, here are the things you may want to consider watching out for, and here are the things you should probably not have to worry about because you're pretty good at those things. Um, so, so for me, you know, controlling my tongue, uh, and it's a double-edged sword, Doug. Uh, let's face it, those who have a gift of eloquence have to be a little more careful controlling the tongue when it's not appropriate to open the mouth and use it. Um, and then on the other hand, I'm a self-starter, so doing things collaboratively with people is a little harder for me. So I have to work on that virtue. So it's a balancing act. Well, you say here, uh, Ryan, whatever the challenge may be, after it's been acknowledged, the formation of your will is the first step to overcoming it. And that is the first step, is figuring out what it is, right? Yeah, absolutely. You have to know the battle you're up against. And you have to know your, your, your role in that. And so we, we rely a lot. I mean, we're first to admit there's nothing new in the book in the sense that what we take is a 2,000-year collective wisdom of the church and try to make it an easy sort of, you know, easy to consume and easy to apply in your life. So we take the rich theology and philosophy, but we blend it with the practical aspect. And the truth is it's about our will. And so if we think in classical philosophy that, you know, a teeter-totter would be the image that Plato uses. Think of that, you know, fun yet very dangerous How playground toy. How many people toy. today know what a teeter-totter yeah, is? Yeah, I think the lawyers are sitting in on about all the Most playground. of us over 50 do. Cause I realize that. Because the I other mean, guy got uh, off the yeah. other yeah. end and down yeah, we yeah, went, yeah, right? Yeah, and you right. think of that teeter-totter, <laughs> and the reality is that, that our intellect is on one side and our appetite is on the other. And the appetite is the fat kid on the teeter-totter. Our mm -hmm. appetites are always bigger than what we actually need. Mm -hmm. And our will sort of rolls back between the two. And what, you know, ancient Greek philosophy says is that the will aligned with the intellect can direct the appetite towards what is good, beautiful, and true. But the will allied with the appetite can suppress the intellect. Yeah. So, so much of entering into a yes. life of happiness is aligning your will with your intellect to really choose that which will bring you to, to the fruits of happiness. So you're saying, Ryan, as a, an educated man of the 21st century, we have to rely still on what some Greek philosophers said so long ago. There's, with our progressive understanding, <laughs> there's not greater insights into humanity and people? Go figure, the truth from 3,500 years ago still applies to today. I mean, there's some basic truths of the human heart, and we can test this. We all know, you know, whether we, we're, we're sitting in front of a cheesecake, whatever the case might be, oh, our appetite good. tends to be larger <laughs> than, than, you know, than, than we need. And that's a beautiful gift, but our will then has mm -hmm. to be aligned to direct our appetite towards that which is good for us. Yeah, so many of us work out physically. We need to work out our souls, and that's what the book's all about. It's, you say, of the many false dichotomies in the world, the two that are perhaps the most destructive to Christianity are the dichotomy between faith and action. And you go on to say, when we experience shipwrecks and lightning bolts, many well-intentioned Christians seem to suggest simply by praying more, our problems will go away. Conversely, the solution to the challenge we face uh, may not be action either. Action without purpose is another mistake to avoid. Faith and work goes together. And uh, when we cooperate with God, cooperate, we cooperate. He wants us to be part of it. So, uh, you know, as the, as the saying goes, you, you work as if everything depends on you. You pray as if knowing that the grace and all comes from God. And it is a collaborative method. Uh, it's what Jesus taught. And thank God he invites us to be part of this salvific mission where he's not doing it all, we're not doing it. It's a collaborative work where it's grace and nature building together. But we have to step out like the prodigal son. You have to turn toward the father. He'll come running to you, but you have to make that effort to turn toward him. Do we also have to get it in the right order? It seems like in the world today, sometimes we think we can just jump to the action and somehow in doing the actions, the faith or the prayer kind of comes. I think we need 
the sustenance mm -hmm. first that comes from the prayer, right? Oh, absolutely. You know, when we think about it, every problem that we have in life, you know, so for instance, if my problem is that, that I need coffee, you know, I can sit there and pray for coffee, but God in his goodness has given me hands and feet and you know, a means to make coffee. So I have to participate in those actions that, that produce the outcome. But it does start with discernment. It does start with prayer. But this idea of cooperation in some ways is the most beautiful teaching of our faith. And as Catholics, we have this in spades. God comes to meet us. God is a God who is constantly reaching out. But because of free will, we have to reach back. So it is both that discernment, but then also that action. And I think very often, we either stay just looking for a spiritual solution to practical physical problems, or we look to a physical solution for really real spiritual yeah. problems. Yeah. And the reality yeah. is we need to bring both it's, together. There's two things that are happening on. That's why you say the genius of the devil has convinced the world he doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Also, you talk about, uh, Ryan, the idea of remembering and then forgetting. Yeah. yeah, I had the opportunity to teach uh, Old Testament scripture for 15 years at university in Phoenix. And one of the realities of the drama of the Old Testament is that we constantly forget who we are and God comes to remind us who we are. This is the drama between God and Israel. So too with us, right? We forget that we're beloved sons and daughters. We forget that our identity is not in our sin, right? Our identity is actually in, in who God sees us as. And so you know, to remember who we are and not forget is so key part of the life. And because we're beloved sons and daughters of the Father, when we sin, God is not angry that we sin. God is sad that we look for happiness in a place that we will never find it. And in some ways, we have to reorient the way that we think about virtue, that growing in these spiritual muscles actually brings us closer to God, helps us find our fulfillment, and is part of God's really design for each and every one of us. And that's building that habit where you repeat what you keep doing. And so to turn and start building the good habits of virtue and replace the bad habits of vices is, is part of the battle. Now, you talk in the book about temperaments, and you alluded to a little uh, earlier Coward, about your own, your own, et cetera, standard, and, and you also talk about Father Spitzer's, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. you know. Four levels of happiness. Four levels yeah. of happiness, mm -hmm. which we, we talk about on his wonderful program. He's terrific, as Phenomenal. people should all watch on Wednesdays. Mm -hmm. Great program. But you also talk about uh, another gauge of temperament developed by Alexandre Havard is how quickly or slowly a person reacts and how long he can persist. I think that's interesting. Yeah, so uh, I've had the opportunity to teach with Alex out of Moscow okay. for the last 10 years. And one of the things that he's done, which I think is really remarkable, looking at both our, our Catholic uh, philosophy and theology of St. Thomas Aquinas and the ancient Greeks as well, is that you know, if you think of the temperaments, much of it is our immediate reaction to things and how well we can sustain that action. So a choleric, by definition, is somebody that reacts quickly to things and has a lot of sustained energy to continue that way. Whereas the opposite of phlegmatic is somebody who's slow to react and also doesn't have a whole lot of sustained energy. So one of the ways that we describe the temperament as we move into the spiritual lot is trying to help people understand what's that innate native disposition, that biological reality of how they react mm -hmm. to things. And by knowing that, then you can understand the practical ways in which you need to grow in the virtues. Mm -hmm. Now, how did you develop the spiritual audit? Where did, is this something you developed yourself? Is this something you took from someplace else? Or how did it come about? Well, coming from a business background, there, there's Myers-Briggs studies, strength finders, all these different things. And I said, there's assessment tools in the business world and sometimes personality traits. Why don't we do something in the spiritual? Where do I stand with God? If I was standing before him at, the, uh, at his throne being, you know, for judgment, uh, what would he say? Where did I go? Things did I do well? What things didn't I do so well? And so we tried to develop the spiritual audit with a whole lot of great people, and Ryan will tell you more about them, that uh, are skilled experts in psychology and uh, uh, in um, uh, social sciences and things to, to say, how do we take these biblical truths, mm -hmm. how do we take the uh, the Beatitudes, for example, the Ten Commandments, and how do we put it in an assessment tool where people will know, you know, these things I'm doing pretty well, but boy, these are where I need work, and these are my top three where I really need work. Yeah, you know, it's amazing. When we, when we develop the spiritual audit, there's so many good personality assessments, but the reality is that our temperament plus our character is what gives us our personality. Yeah. So character is our experiences, our virtue, how we enter in and lean into the problems of life. But our temperament is really that sort of innate biological foundation of which everything else is built on. So the spiritual audit tries to give you a better understanding of your temperament and then to align that temperament with what are the things that will come naturally to you that you can develop those strengths that if you participate with them will become you know, virtues and those weaknesses that if left unchecked will become vices. So that self-knowledge then in the spiritual audit you know, really propels you then to take an honest look at what virtues do I need to grow in? Mm -hmm. What vices do I need to sort of conquer in my life that are robbing me of peace right. and stealing my joy? And so we developed it, and it's a very simple, I mean, it's, it's almost, in many ways, we, we beta tested it with college students and others, with small groups, 
And the feedback we got from many people were, I always knew this about myself, mm -hmm. but this has given me a new way of understanding how I'm called to participate. Right, with, but with it my, would only work if you're honest with yourself. Right? Absolutely. Yep. Otherwise, you start yeah. people looking at the answer key in the back trying to figure out how do I get the, a, a, well, a 10 rating here. Well, the yeah, beautiful the, thing is there's not yeah, really a 10 right, rating. The idea right. is that each one of us has, has a dominant You can't answer wrong. It's right. about you. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And right. Each of us has a dominant temperament and a secondary temperament, and that will indicate the, the best and most practical ways to grow in the virtue. So for me, for instance, I'm a sanguine. I'm a high sanguine. I love people. I'm motivated by relationships. I'm way more ephemeral, you know, and, and way less, you know, sustained energy. I'm, I'm, I, I'm fleeting. And if I know that about myself, then I know that I need to grow in perseverance, that, that component of the virtue of fortitude or of courage. If I know that about myself as a sanguine, I know I'll always be challenged with, with staying the course on things. Mm -hmm. I know I'll always be challenged by my senses, so the, you know, the virtue of, of temperance will be so important. So by taking the spiritual audit, you get a, a new understanding of the strengths and weaknesses that come from your temperament, and then you can start building upon those. Well, you talk about the power of the will, and today it's, it seems like will to power is more what people are into, and there's a difference there, of course. It is neither all God nor all us. It is God and us. We must cooperate with God because he gave us the gift of free will so that we could love him by loving him and others, and why do we love God, and why is that an important component in your life? Yeah. First of all, there's three kinds of wills. There's a weak will, a strong will, and God's will. And Mary knew God's will, her fiat, huh? be it done unto me according to your word. We have to align ourselves with God's wills, because a weak will and a strong will both have limitations, and they both have some advantages, but generally it's God's will we're looking for. And in terms of living God's love, Man, you know, he created us in his image. When we align our will with God's will and truly surrender to his will, that's when we're in peace. We really find the peace that surpasses understanding, a peace that only comes from God. And I think every human heart is seeking that. We have a homing device, as Archbishop Fulton Sheen uh, always taught, that we have a homing device that, that keeps sending us back to God. And uh, we have that empty place in our heart that Augustine talked about, that we're not fulfilled until we do it God's way. So that's what we have to do. First, recognize the problem, that we have a problem. Secondly, how am I wired? Where are my strengths and weaknesses? And then what is the plan for me to uh, accentuate the virtues, build those virtue muscles, so that I can really find and live in God's will. He loved me first, how do I respond in love? Uh, the strong will, uh, we're using that term here, is not to be confused with the will that seeks greatness. And you talk about Stoicism, which I know Father Spitzer is really anti-Stoic, but <laughs> there's a lot of people have taken that as an approach, a kind yeah. of a Stoic approach. How is that different? Yeah, so one approach would simply say that, that the goal of life is, is to become what I want to be and just learn how to interact with, with nature, right? Sort of just the path of least resistance. Yeah. What happens with that is that journey of self-discovery is all inward focused. Yeah. Right? It's not liberated by an idea of the eternity. It's not liberated by an idea of participating with God's will. I mean, the most radical thing of our Christian faith is that God actually wants us to be happy. Yes. God calls us to participate. That God loved us so much, he became one of us to save us. And so the reality is that Stoicism, while it might be good in many of what it teaches about mm -hmm. our responsibility in life, it doesn't go far enough to call us to the greatness of life that we're all designed for. And you're also talking up here about creating new habits and right. good habits using the virtues, right? Right. Yeah, and building them. And when you re replicate that habit over and over again, it becomes muscle memory, second nature to you, uh, just like in sports or, or in other things. So uh, that's part of it. How do you get back on that path? And then how do you stay on that path and build that spiritual muscle? And you actually have, the, the churches usually have, was it seven? And you've mm -hmm. got like 13. 13. Mm -hmm. yes. so, well, how did you end up with more? And what is yeah. great heartedness? Yeah, so let's, let's talk about why we came with 13. So first, you know, the theological virtues of faith, hope, and love. Those are gifts from God. The, the proper posture of those is ones with hands open, right? We in docility to receive them. So when we want more, more faith, hope, or love, we pray for them, and God infuses us with them. But the cardinal virtues, the catechism says, are, are built and conditioned upon human work. They take effort. So prudence, justice, temperance, and fortitude, or courage. You know, those, when I pray for those things, God doesn't infuse me with them. He could. When I pray for more courage, no, he gives me an opportunity to grow in that habit. When I pray for patience, he doesn't infuse me with patience. He puts me in the longest line at the grocery store. And so we took those cardinal virtues and we added essentially some additional ones. So we started with compassion, the one that we feel is most needed today. We also added humility and then great heartedness, which you just mentioned. Magnanimity was, was the prince of virtues in the ancient world. It was this recognition that we are called as beloved sons and daughters of the Father to do great things, to use our life and to pour it out in a gift to others. Think of 
all of the saints, as, as different as they were, as, as diverse as their temperaments. I mean, St. Peter, as he was converted, his rashness, his brazenness, it didn't change. His temperament didn't change, but it became directed towards the glory of God. And so this great heartedness is about recognizing our gifts and seeking to bring them as a gift to others and ultimately to serve the good Lord who has given us these gifts. Is there also a sense that one needs to balance these virtues? Because sometimes you end up with mother used to refer to as false compassion. Mm -hmm. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and as a parent, you understand that. Oh, yeah. Well, that wisdom balances those things. So, yeah, it's always, it's always a balance, and we have to make sure that we're in, uh, in that balance. But, you know, the great heartedness makes sense because we're on the winning team. Christ won the battle for us, saved us, but we don't act like we're, we act like Eeyore's out there. Like, and, and when it's really, really dark, we're down, we're dour, and it's like, wait, it's always darkest before the dawn. We're on the winning team. We have a father with cattle on a thousand hills. This is good news. Right. And you talk about the balance and the reality of the, the, of the virtues, and we walk through it in the book. If you understand the battle and you know yourself, then you can start to select the virtues you need to work on. And in each chapter, we describe really the historical understanding of the virtue. We look at the philosophy, the theology. The we look saints. at scripture, mm -hmm. the lives of the saints, those who had the virtue and grew in that virtue. And then we look specifically at your temperament and the particular you know, areas of your temperament that you might need to understand to grow in the virtue. So the hope is that you, you can really learn, like you said, to balance one's life around the virtues to really right. become the person God has called you to be and do so joyfully. Right. Well said. Thank you so much, Tom Peterson, of course, Ryan Hanning. The book is The Willpower Advantage, Building Habits for Lasting Happiness, available through our EWTN Religious Catalog. Check it out. Worth checking out. And see us next time right here on Bookmark. Thank you.